Well, thank you, uh, Chair DeGette, for holding this hearing to tackle the skyrocketing insulin prices. I recently met with a family from back home in Tampa, nine-year-old Brooke and her father, Todd, uh, explained to me how she was diagnosed when she was three days old in the hospital and how they've struggled with uh, her diabetes since then. But it's not just the big struggle hasn't really been on the health side. It's been with affording insulin and drugs. Uh, they've had to change their lifestyle a little bit. And Todd told me at one point they had run out of insulin two weeks before the end of the month and had to borrow a vial from an adult friend of ours who was using Humalog and had numerous vials stockpiled. And that's how, he said, that how, that's how we do it now. We tell our endocrinologist that we use more insulin than we need in a month. So she writes prescriptions for slightly more than we use. Uh, since the vials are good for two years, we have extra in case anything happens. At the end of the day, we count ourselves blessed that both my wife and I work and our insurance sufficiently helps pay for all of Brooke's uh, type 1 diabetes supplies. But the beginning of the year is still very difficult until we pay our deductibles and we choose to pay more for our insurance out of pocket to make those deductibles. But he says, I cannot fathom how a family can choose to limit or ration insulin for their children. The system needs to be fixed. And then I asked Brooke, I said, what would you, as a nine-year-old having to deal with this, what would you want me to ask? She says, why do we have laws that protect kids' safety, like bike helmets, seat belts, and indoor smoking bans, but not laws that would allow them to get the medicines they need to stay alive? So this, things have got to change. So let's start with manufacturers' list prices and how we get them under control. It seems to be that just about everyone in the supply chain except the patient is benefiting from increasing list prices. Mr. Mason, if rebates and fees tied to list price were to be restricted or eliminated, do we have any guarantee from Eli Lilly that prices <coughs> would go down and patients would pay less? We would definitely consider that. And Mr. Langa? Yeah, we, we would consider that, yes. But is there a guarantee? What we, what's important to us, again, is that, that the majority of patients can have access at affordable pricing. And as long as there was that in place, then yes, we would consider that. Ms. Tregoning? Yes, as long as we can assure patient access and affordability on formularies, then we would certainly lower list price with the elimination of rebates. Okay, there's, a, there's another um, hitch in the system here, and that's kind of the gaming of charitable contributions. It's been reported that some manufacturers use the patient assistance programs to reduce their own tax burden, that by donating drugs to these patient assistance programs, the company is able to deduct the value of donated drugs from its taxes. In 2015, I understand Lilly donated $408 million worth of drugs to the Lilly Cares Foundation. Mr. Mason, should manufacturers be able to benefit financially from the patient assistance programs? The, the, we do it only to help patients. We don't want anyone not to afford. But boy, that's a big $408 million mm -hmm. then I would think we would see some commensurate reduction of the list price that would be tied to that. Our net prices are going down. And then what, what you're not seeing is we spent $108 million last year on, on savings offers that helped 525,000 people. Uh, those, those aren't a tax write-up. I think there, this is an issue here, though, with these, the, these kind of charitable contributions. You seem to be benefiting on both sides, and patients aren't. So but on the turning to the PBMs, Ms. Bricker, if fees paid to PBMs and wholesalers are standardized and entirely delinked from the list price, what impact would it have on what the patient ultimately pays? Um, over 50% of our clients receive all fees that are collected by manu from manufacturers, and 95% of all fees and discounts and rebates are passed on to our plan sponsors. And so ultimately, when you delink the fee from the list price, there really is nothing that prevents the manufacturer from continuing to increase the price. So, Mr. Dutta, the mission of PBMs is to get the lowest price possible for drugs for their clients, but that clearly isn't happening. Uh, how can we change the system to better align out-of-pocket patient costs to negotiated net cost instead of the list prices? Well, 76% of our members today either pay $0 copay or most commonly a flat copay of $35. And for that other percentage that you're asking about, 
that are on a coinsurance or a high deductible plan, we advocate for point of sale rebates uh, as well as preventative drug lists such that insulins would not apply to the deductible. I yield back my time. Thank you.